Do you know that you are a transhuman? I don't know whether you agree, but in the next few minutes, I will try to convince you that indeed you are, and that all of us are in a condition that transcends that of what we would normally call a traditional, simple, baseline human being. Let me start with an anecdote. In 2013, the book Inferno was published by Dan Brown. And if you haven't read it yet, skip ahead a few minutes in this video because there will be unavoidable spoilers. The protagonist of this book is Robert Langdon, the uh, um, study, uh, the, the, the researcher, uh, the professor of symbology that um, is unavoidably drawn into some um, criminal plot, uh, which then he triumphantly resolves at the end of the book. And when the book was published, I was contacted by journalists who would point to some particular passage of the book and ask me about it. And at the beginning, I didn't realize the female protagonist, Sienna Brooks, that works together with Langdon in a somewhat ambiguous role, has a conversation with him where she points to an napkin drawing on it a symbol, H+. Plus. And Langdon replies, oh, I thought it was a chemistry conference. All of Harvard University was plastered with these posters uh, promoting uh, that meeting. And she responds, no, it wasn't. It was the largest gathering of transhumanists ever. That is where Bertrand Zobrist, the bad guy of the book, gets his idea that leads to the release of a virus aiming to destroy humanity. Now, it turns out that I organized that conference together with uh, then executive director of Humanity Plus, where I was chairman, Alex Lightman, at Harvard University, the H Plus Summit was held in June 2010. It was a pretty controversial conference. We had many, many speakers, um, more than 50 uh, in two days in parallel tracks, uh, Ray Kurzweil, Stephen Wolfram, uh, Ben Gertzel, Natasha Vita Moore, um, a, Andy Hassel, a Jordi Rose, and many, many others. All friends and all firm believers of how technology can help humanity to address our challenges, to hopefully overcome them, to improve the human condition. But there were people who didn't want the conference to happen. The Dean of Harvard received anonymous letters asking him to stop the conference from being held. And obviously, um, we are relieved to report that he didn't listen and he wanted the conference to go ahead and to be as provocative, as meaningful as it could be and as it uh, uh, happened to be. So when the journalists called me, I looked at the list of participants and I could tell them, no, uh, Bertrand Zabrist doesn't appear in the list of speakers or participants. And of course, uh, Dan Brown didn't either. Uh, just uh, a few months ago, um, I learned from another friend that uh, he was sitting on Dan Brown's uh, uh, side uh, in the audience without um, recognizing him at the time and, and asked uh, what uh, he did uh, for a living very modestly uh, or with false modesty, uh, he answered, I write. This book sold millions of copies. Uh, actually, uh, there is uh, a companion to Inferno 
uh, which is also a quite um, thick book. Um, and uh, I was asked to give an interview uh, for this uh, companion book so that um, book clubs that would read Inferno could also interpret it with the help of that companion book. And then, of course, the movie came out and so on and so forth, really um, popularizing certain ideas, of course, with that Hollywood streak of alarmist, apocalyptic um, tendency of drawing our, our attention. Now, transhumanism is becoming more and more known. Um, it is a movement that started several decades ago, originally in the 60s, then in the 80s, in waves of becoming more and more popular. The World Transhumanist Association was formed, of which I became chairman, then it changed its name to Humanity Plus to concentrate more on the positive sides of uh, what uh, other people could understand of its uh, aims. It is quite interesting uh, and intriguing actually to note that if possible, one of the first uh, transhumanists uh, was Dante. Dante Alighieri, in his, um, in his uh, Divine Comedy, in the book, the third book, uh, Paradise, in the first uh, canto of the Paradise, says, Trasumanar significar per verba non si poria. You can't explain in words what it means to transcend the human condition. And he talks about the Catholic Christian paradise where you go after you are dead. But what we are talking about is a changing definition of what it means to be human while living on this world. You and I and everybody else together because Technology is profoundly transforming the human condition to the point that talking about what it means to be human without taking into account the role of technology and the accelerating pace of change of technology as it changes our human condition and the very definition of what it means to be human would be meaningless. If we look at biologically, to be human means to belong to the species Homo sapiens. And maybe Homo sapiens sapiens, as distinct and separate from Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, for example, or other subspecies, biologically speaking, of Homo sapiens that existed and are now extinct, or actually partially extinct, as it has been established that all of us carry a variable percentage of Homo sapiens neanderthalensis genes between 1% and 2-3% except people who are from Africa and they did not um, have um, shared, um, the, uh, they, they, they don't descend from Caucasian people, but they are purely of African genetic pools because they don't have Neanderthal genes. Sam Harris remarked how horrific it would have been from an interpretation point of view of the scientific fact if it were the reverse, how white supremacists would have gone 
and where they would have gone if it were the reverse. So it happens that Homo sapiens and our genes intermingled among various uh, subspecies. But it is also true and very important to note that we have been defined and we have always depended on technology for survival. There is no such a thing as a natural human devoid and distinct from technology. Whether it is a simple wooden spare, whether it is fire to cook food, whether it is the iPhone to communicate across the globe. These tools in their first emergence are separated by 100,000 or 500,000 years, depending on how you are counting. But they are joined by the fact that we as a species and as individuals very strongly depend on them. Not only very strongly depend on them, but our dependence is increasing. The type of knowledge, resilience and skills that I would need to survive in a wilderness are beyond my ability to acquire or to deploy. Or rather, I wouldn't last long. And we didn't last long. Even though all of the knowledge was available to survive in natural conditions, surviving in natural conditions universally meant to survive until we could reproduce and until we could bring up the, our children to reproductive age and then very quickly to be gone. Personally, I would have died many times if technology were not available. Just to quote a couple of these reasons, um, when I was little, I would very, very frequently get um, infections that would affect my tonsils to the point where I would be close to suffocating. And the application of antibiotics and later on the surgical removal of my tonsils that at the time in the 70s was quite common, stopped one of these infections killing me. But if neither antibiotics nor surgical options would have been available, it is very likely that I would have died in my teens. A second example is that I wear glasses. And even though uh, in a modern environment, these glasses are almost never a must have, except for example, when I drive the car, if I had to go hunting, I guarantee that I could have had the best skills with a, an arrow and bow to get the animal. But if I couldn't see the animal, there were no chance that I would be tolerated in the tribe that needed to feed me without me contributing to uh, the success of a hunt. Can you today survive contributing to your tribe, your society, for example, with different skills or lacking those skills, rather? Skills like reading and writing, the equivalent of being able to hunt. Rather than hunting for animals, you hunt for ideas. Rather than sharing the prey, you share ideas. And your ability to share depends on your ability to read, write, maybe to speak a foreign language, 
certainly these days at an increasing rate, being able to use the computer or the smartphone. And I can practically guarantee that as we go into the third decade of the 21st century, your ability to use augmented reality or virtual reality components or uh, to test and then accept and, and use, eagerly deploy various kinds of ever more intimate interfaces with devices that augment your abilities is going to be necessary and un unavoidable. And even more so, if we go further in the fourth and the fifth decades of the century and talk about space colonization, radically supporting humans to survive in space or on Mars or other places of the solar system that do not inherently have the support environment that we enjoy on Earth is going to be necessary, unavoidable. Technology is not only going to enhance the human condition, our ability to communicate and to organize, technology is going to be a necessary existential condition in order to survive. And then, of course, we will have the choice if we want to intervene and modify our genetic makeup in order to accelerate our ability to adapt to different environmental conditions. This has already been happening even in the scales of our own species. A simple example is our ability to digest lactose which emerged as a genetic modification fairly recently, about 30,000 years ago, and it hasn't had the chance of spreading all across the various human populations. It is much more prevalent in Caucasian genetic pools than not Asian or African ones. But the pace of biological change is not only too slow, it is too random. We cannot wait around until by complete chance some favorable genetic variation emerges and we stumble upon it and we say, oh, that is exactly what we need in order to successfully survive on the lower gravitational attraction of the Martian surface, for example, which is just one third of that of Earth, and it may very well require some adaptation that goes beyond our desire or ability to, to keep exercising every day uh, in order to prevent calcium depletion in our bones that uh, makes them fragile or other kinds of negative effects that we could experience. Under those conditions, our ability to intervene and change our genetic makeup, not only of adults, but also of our progeny, of our children, so that they would inherit these adaptations, will be irresistible. And then, of course, there will be further changes, further opportunities. We will address them in other episodes of the context, but let me just mention a couple. Would you go through a process of backing up your mind and if you did, would you readily sign up for a service that would instantiate your mind when you died? 
Or actually, would you be curious enough to boot up an instance of yourself in parallel of your biological identity that still existed? What about artificial intelligences? If and when we create an artificial general intelligence, an AGI, will we endow it with rights and duties? Will we emancipate it? Or will we pretend to be able to keep it as a slave? And if we do emancipate it, what will we call it? Will we call it a human? Will we call it a transhuman? Will we call it a past human? And what will be the civilization that includes uploaded minds that originally were biological, but they are not today, that include biological humans that have been genetically modified in order to be adapted to radically different environments? Artificial intelligences that communicate, that are empathic, that make moral choices, that have their own goals, but are of a different rootstock, undeniably. And then, of course, traditional humans, those that either because of a religious conviction or because of a lack of means or opportunities, or just by personal choice, do not embrace the opportunities that accelerating radical technologies are going to offer. It is going to be very important to open a deep and broad conversation as soon as possible around these challenges, because all of these participants in our rich and varied civilization are going to be with us, sharing the solar system and the universe. And we should be ready to make the right choices so that we create a future that is desirable and where we feel as humans, transhumans, posthumans, all together at home. So thank you very much. I am curious to learn whether you agree that you are a transhuman or not. Send me your feedback in the comments, via email. I greatly enjoy receiving everybody's opinion, whether they support or whether they disagree with what I say. And I'm looking forward to having you follow the context in our next episodes as well.